Welcome to lecture 23 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll look at the concept of spectrally agile waveforms and try and get a better understanding of how these, how these types of waveforms are created and employed as well as some of the practical issues associated with them. So in today's world, we are surrounded by various wireless services and applications. And as these services and application increase in number, we begin to, to run into a situation known as spectrum scarcity. So as a result, um, uh, the amount of available spectrum left in order to accommodate new and, uh, gr and growing number of wireless applications actually begins to decrease. And we need to think of ways of accessing spectrum more uh, efficiently in order to accommodate this uh, continued growth and interest in wireless access. The problem is, is that most prime wireless spectrum, uh, that which is below three gigahertz in frequency, carrier frequency, is mostly been licensed out or allocated. And so what we need is a better way of, first of all, detecting uh, what spectrum is available and then be able to transmit across whatever uh, available morsels of spectrum are, uh, are, are out there. In order to accomplish this, we use something called a spectrally agile waveform. And a spectrally agile waveform is one where you do not necessarily need to transmit in one contiguous block of uh, frequency spectrum, but rather two or more uh, simultaneous frequency blocks such that the aggregate bandwidth is equal to what your transmission requires in order to get that information across. As a result, uh, quite a few folks have looked at um, a, a variant of OFDM called non-contiguous OFDM in order to meet uh, this, uh, this type of uh, spectral agility um, in, in terms of uh, a waveform that can access uh, disjoint uh, groups or blocks of frequency. So as, as I was saying, um, suppose we have in the frequency domain, we have several signals. So let's say we have the license user. Okay. We call them primary users or PU. And then what happens is we know that we're not supposed to interfere or, um, um, or in any way inter uh, um, you know, sort of inhibit uh, their communication. So uh, what we do with a spectrally agile waveform is we, transform, we transmit in these sort of available gaps. These, uh, we call them spectrum holes or spectral holes, spectral holes. Okay. And so what we're trying to accomplish essentially is to make the accessing of the spectrum more efficient. Because right now, if you look at this, let's say based on this chunk of spectrum we're observing, these two primary users are only accessing, well, it looks like about 20% of the available spectrum within this region. When, and, and, and the problem is current uh, spectrum regulations indicate that um, these primary users, these licensed users, uh, have exclusive access to that spectrum, which is, it is a problem because that means they're not really maximally using that spectrum. So what happens if you set up some framework where the primary user's rights are respected? You're not supposed to interfere with them, but other users with approved technology by some sort of uh, federal regulator is allowed to sort of occupy the, un, uh, the available portions of the spectrum. So let's say I have this guy, this guy, let's say he's another user. Uh, let's say we have two more users and another user here. And we call these guys secondary users or SUs. And so what the secondary users are, essentially are the um, non-license holding uh, transceivers, uh, but they respect the rights of the incumbent or the primary users in that spectrum. And yet we maximize spectral efficiency because now how much of the spectrum is unused? Well, almost none. Um, all of it is, is, we're looking at like a 95% spectral efficiency, which is great. That's, that's really objective of uh, spectrally agile waveforms. So because suppose, uh, for instance, this guy and this guy actually belong to the same signal. We don't necessarily need a contiguous block of unoccupied spectrum. We can just have two blocks of spectrum and then stitch them together at the receiver, combine them together, if you will. Same thing here this guy and this guy and this guy 
and this guy, they might all be just like transmitting in sort of these different blocks, but they're all the same signal, just demultiplex, uh, the data is demultiplexed into those separate frequencies, but we reintegrate them back at the receiver. So based on the example we just saw, um, there are ways of making more efficient use of wireless spectrum. We don't need contiguous blocks of spectrum or transmit a signal. We can use several frequencies all at the same time in order to get our information across. And then somehow the receiver aggregates all this the data across these different frequency bands in order to provide us with a single, um, the single transmission that we were hoping to get in the first place. Now, how do we accomplish this? Okay. Well, what happens is um, there are a variety of different techniques that have been proposed in the literature and people are exploring in terms of trying to perform spectrally agile waveform uh, design and access in today's uh, modern world. And so uh, a few concepts are things like spectrum pooling, where you, you have a sort of a common inventory of spectral resources that are made available by licensed users and uh, unlicensed or secondary entities uh, sort of bid or allocated a portion of frequency and time in order to uh, to use and access this spectrum and and that's great and and I think uh, it's it's actually heading in the direction of sort of a database model and potentially there are some uh, sort of commercial opportunities too because the business model imagine if licensed users that are or licensed entities and service providers that have available spectrum could uh, rent out spectrum uh, at some sort of profit to themselves. Um, to, to these secondary entities. Another approach is using cooperative and, uh, techniques where um, you exchange information um, across spectrum in coordination with all other users uh, of that spectrum as well. So nobody really conflicts with each other as opposed to a non-cooperative approach where um, there's almost no exchange and, and people sort of um, transmit opportunistically um, uh, regardless of how they potentially could interfere with, 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 with each other. So they, well, they, they do care about the interference, but what happens is it's almost like um, um, uh, first come first serve in terms of spectrum access. And so these types of systems act in a greedy approach. And then finally, in addition to spectrum pooling and cooperative and non-cooperative approaches, there are underlay and overlay techniques, which we'll look at right now. So an underlay technique uh, operates by flying below the radar and transmitting your signal beneath, let's say, the energy level um, of, of, let's say, some existing signal, such that you're not heard, and thus you can sort of pro provide your information without being detected by, by that other user. Problem is, is that uh, these sort of techniques do increase the interference and noise floor um, around spectrally, and that could impact the performance of the signals that you're uh, sort of operating underneath, as I'll draw right now. So spectrum underlay looks like this. So suppose we have our frequency domain chart and our primary user looks like this. Badly drawn primary user, here's another primary user. And what happens is our underlay signal is transmitting here. And suppose that the uh, interference and noise floor is here. What happens is, if you notice, the secondary user the, uh, that's performing this underlay approach won't be detected by the primary user. So as long as you transmit at an extremely low transmit power, um, the primary user won't pick you up. So technologies that accomplish this um, include spread spectrum communications, spread spectrum, and something called ultra wideband. Okay, or UWB. Another approach is to use spectral overlay where you find opportunities in spectrum that are unused, um, both in space, frequency, and time, and you transmit your signal in between those opportunities. And now this is where spectrally agile waveforms um, are great because uh, let's say you have three or four available portions of spectrum uh, each of them too narrow to, uh, to by themselves support the transmission you're trying to get across. But imagine if you take three or four of these opportunities and transmit portions of your information across each one of them such that the aggregate bandwidth is equal to the or ex exceeds uh, the bandwidth that you need uh, for your transmission. This would be great.
And this is how it will look like in, in the frequency domain. So uh, if we look at an overlay approach, we kind of saw this before already. What ends up happening is we have our primary user here and here. And what happens is our secondary user now occupies the gaps in between. Let's say there, there, and there. So what happens is we identify where are these opportunities where the spectrum is available, let's say from this region to that region. So this is available spectrum. And say here, this is also available. And here, this is also available. And we transmit across it. But we're very mindful that wherever we come close to where the primary user is, we avoid any sort of energy from our own signal, our own transmission, uh, spilling over and interfering with that other signal. Otherwise, uh, this won't work and we'll be asked to leave that spectrum. So conceptually, uh, using spectrally agile waveforms to perform dynamic spectrum access, which again is the uh, ability to access spectrum on an opportunistic level where we, we access unused portions of frequency spectrum that are not used by the license holder uh, for a short period of time or whatever period of time that is not needed by the license holder, the primary user, uh, to get our information across, right? Now, the problem is, is that um, we, we need to minimize, if not mitigate, any interference to the license transmissions. Uh, so that's um, uh, sort of challenge number one. And number two, is to be able to readily identify gaps in the time frequency uh, electrospace model such that we don't end up walking on anyone else's toes, especially the licensed transmissions. So for that, uh, we go back to our NCOFDM transmitter and receiver. So let's look at the NCOFDM transmitter and, and uh, observe how it operates. So an OFDM, an NCOFDM transmitter looks like almost like an OFDM transmitter, but with a few differences. So you have your high speed input, X of N. Some people can actually do the digital modulation here, right? So we can make it like some sort of PSK modulation. Do the serial to parallel conversion, but this is, I'm gonna get to in a, back in a minute, what's happening with that serial to parallel conversion. Then you perform your IFFT to modulate your subcarriers, because those are your subcarriers, to different center frequencies, right? We insert our cyclic extension, okay, the CP, and then from there, we do the parallel to serial conversion, and out goes our composite OFDM waveform. So how, does, how do we make this NCOFDM? Well, let's look closely. What we would do is we would essentially have several of the subcarriers here that correspond to frequency locations that, that are located on the uh, location of, um, of a primary user. We would deactivate the subcarriers. So if we take a closer look at the signal the serial to parallel converter and we take a commutator approach or viewpoint, what would essentially happen is we would feed data to only those subcarriers that correspond to locations that are available. So uh, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And the commutator would essentially skip those subcarriers and just, it would be initialized to zero. So it would just tra transmit no information on those subcarriers. And that would essentially translate to in the frequency domain as something that looks like this. There should be a subcarrier there, but it's deactivated, zero. There should be a subcarrier here, but it's deactivated, zero. And then here we go, one more. So that's subcarrier one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, six, four and five are deactivated. And now let's look at the NCOFDM receiver, which is supposed to detect the locations of where these 
uh, groupings of active subcarriers are in the frequency domain and properly decode and, and, and combine them back into and reconstruct the original uh, high-speed data input that was fed at the transmitter. At the receiver, it too almost looks like an OFDM receiver, except that we, okay, we have serial parallel, do 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 uh, it gets fed into uh, the cyclic extension thing, right? The cyclic extension remover. So these guys, these poor guys, CP, bye-bye. And these remaining guys, if there are N of them, go into the FFT to be demodulated, the subcarriers, to baseband frequencies. And then we have a commutator here, our uh, parallel serial converter that makes it into a single high-speed stream X hat of N. Now, what happens is, um, just as before, we need some sort of advanced information to tell us at the parallel serial conversion which subcarriers possess no information and exclude those from, uh, from the commutator here. It's just like in the transmitter end. We have essentially a commutator and we have an arm and it's rotating and it will only take information off of those subcarriers that have any and we'll skip the rest. So one, two, three, six, we're gonna actually take information off of those and four and five, we skip those because they, they have no information to yield anyway. And that way we can actually transmit non-contiguous information down several groups of subcarriers um, and sort of deactivate those subcarriers that are potentially going to interfere with uh, other signals, especially licensed or primary user signals um, in, in this manner. Now the problem with um, NCOFDM is that in the frequency domain, its pulse shapes for each subcarrier is a sync pulse, which means that it has very high out of band or OOB interference levels. And this could be a problem if you're transmitting in approximate proximity to other signals, especially license signals, which we're not supposed to interfere with. So let's let's look at this graphically and how this could be potentially a problem. So remember what I was saying about uh, OFDM and NCOFDM having spectral the subcarriers having spectral signatures that uh, or characteristics that look like sync pulses. So let's look at that more carefully. So uh, let's say the magnitude squared of a sync pulse looks like this, right? And this is what we're worried about, is these side lobes. So this is what we refer to as side lobes. And so what happens is, suppose you have a, a license signal. So this is your band that you're allocated to transmit. So that's available. But Suppose now you have um, a primary user that's there. The problem is all of this. This could cause OOB interference. And that's what we need to minimize. And imagine in an OFDM signal, not only do we have one subcarrier, right but we have multiple and those two and and all of those subcarriers contribute to out of band radiation so the uh, aggregate oob is actually quite large and unless we can can come up with ways to mitigate that uh, we can't really transmit subcarriers in close proximity close frequency proximity to primary signals without uh, exposing them to our interference so there are a variety of ways of mitigating um, uh, the, the out-of-band uh, emissions caused by an NCOFDM transceiver. Uh, there are things like windowing, where we sort of literally filter out um, uh, the, the out-of-band emissions. But this doesn't really work very well when you're like sort of notching in between different, uh, uh, different groupings of subcarriers. We can also use something called carrier, uh, subcarrier cancellation techniques, where we insert uh, subcarriers um, with amplitudes and phases at specific frequency locations that they don't bear much carry any information, but 
when you combine them with the out-of-band emissions caused by the other subcarriers, begin to negatively combine with them and actually um, uh, 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 reduces them, just like in physics, like a sort of destructive uh, uh, interference. You lower those levels. You can also use things like constellation expansion and, and have modulation schemes that can be chosen from one of several possible signal uh, symbol waveform outputs, um, choosing those that yield lower um, or lowest possible out-of-band emissions, and then finally using a series of filter banks to filter out individual uh, groupings of subcarriers f filtering out their out-of-band emissions from each grouping. So each of these techniques possess a, a variety of pros and cons and really nobody has a great answer in terms of how to actually implement, uh, implement this in practice. Okay. So, so as a result um, there's also another practical issue which is the complexity issue which is we know that OFDM is usually implemented using a fast Fourier transform and an inverse fast Fourier transform, the FFT and the IFFT, respectively. Now, what ends up happening is, suppose we now deactivate or we feed zeros, like no information down some of these uh, subcarriers, what we're doing is we're actually wasting hardware resources on the, um, the FFT and IFFT butterflies that constitute the OFDM transceiver. So these multiplies and adds, all they're doing is they're multiplying zeros and adding zeros, which really is just sort of wasted operations. And there are ways the, of removing sort of the, those unused multiplies and adds, which we will refer to as FFT pruning, which we'll see right now. So if I wanted to do some FFT pruning, I would essentially take my FFT butterfly. So suppose I have something that looks like this. Okay. And we saw what, how a butterfly works. It's just essentially the same sort of standard unit applied to different, um, to d different branches of an input. So we would have um, a, a collection of inputs here let's say from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then this would be, let's say, our frequency domain, our individual subcarriers, frequency domain, and this would be the time domain, okay? And what would happen is I would take the butterfly and uh, I would uh, send it and feed it into an adder here and then likewise, I would take here a guy and feed it into an adder there. And then what happens is I would do the same across all these guys, right? Because that's what the butterfly does. Right? And then likewise, same operation at this end. Now, you can imagine, like, it, what we might also do is then we do a multiply, right? Depending on what, if it's a decimation frequency or decimation in time FFT, we would multiply by some sort of weight and then move on to the next stage, which could be something that looks like this. Right? Add, 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 add. And then same thing here. And then last but not least, we might have one more stage. Now, this is going to be fun because now suppose some of the inputs are zero. Suppose this is zero as an input, right? And suppose that this is an input of zero, as well as this guy and this guy. So what happens when we feed a zero this way and we feed a zero down here? Is the adder necessary? No. So we can actually exclude, um, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry. So that would, we, we would exclude the adder and this would be, uh, and then in fact, notice this is a double zero. So we wouldn't really need this path either nor this path. So, so what ends up happening is wherever we have a zero plus something, plus something, that's just going to be equal to something. We can exclude that adder. And when it's a zero times something, 
like the uh, like like when we have those w these guys here and they're more uh, above, what happens is that's going to be equal to zero. So we can actually exclude the multiplies as well. So we can remove redundant adders and multipliers from this FFT butterfly, which represents um, our OFDM transceiver.